silhouetted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 157. Be on the lookout for a car bearing two boys. Number one, blonde, heavy set, has a pug nose. Number two, swarthy complexion, lighter build. These boys are armed and thought to be holding up gas stations. That's all. Rolls and quest. explain to you that Rio Grande cracked gasoline is superior to ordinary gasoline because it is cracked. To make the point still clearer, let us consider another familiar fuel, which is improved by cracking. Coal. Coal, in large lumps, is slow to start burning. Once it begins to burn, it gives plenty of heat, but it burns inefficiently, wastefully. So, coal is broken up into small pieces, cracked. Then it starts to burn easily, develops quick efficient, even heat. This illustrates clearly the difference between cracked and uncracked gasoline. Uncracked gasoline is lumpy gasoline, hard to start, sluggish and wasteful, incapable of perfect combustion. Some of it even flows raw down the cylinder walls. Some is forced, unburned, out the exhaust. Rio Grande cracked gasoline is broken up into tiny atoms by the patented Sinclair cracking process. It starts instantly burns evenly and develops tremendous power. Every possible atom is turned into driving energy. Rio Grande cracked gasoline with tetraethyl is used in more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment wherever it is sold than any other brand. It has been specified as the preferred gasoline for the police department of Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, Fresno, Santa Barbara, San Diego, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many other cities and counties. Exactly the same Rio Grande cracked gasoline featured by your independent Rio Grande dealer. Remember, this is the only gasoline that will give you police car performance in your own car. Try a tank full tomorrow. And now we present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. When you read a story about a kidnapper, you usually think of a hardened man as the perpetrator. But if you could look through the files in our record bureau and see the number of kidnappings, robberies, and murders that are committed by boys still in teens, it would undoubtedly give you quite a shock. Yet it is a fact that the majority of cases, like the one you will hear tonight, are done by juveniles, boys who have turned to a crime career rather than face the responsibilities of an honest one. It is a terrible thing to have to sentence a boy hardly started in life to a long time penitentiary term, but there is no other way out. If we let them off easily, give them another chance, the result would be obvious. They would think they could get away with the same thing again and return to their original career of crime. Our only chance to help these embryonic criminals is to show them in the beginning that crime does not pay. early morning, September 29th, 1936. On the wide cement highway leading out of Olympia, Washington, two boys stand, thumbs pointed south in the familiar gesture of the hitchhiker, and watch the steady line of cars as they speed by. How far so bad? These guys don't seem to even notice Ah, don't worry. Sooner or later, someone will stop. They're bound to. Sure, I know it. Only I still say, so far, so bad. Yeah. Hey, watch it, Hank. Here comes a car with only one guy in it. See if you can look pretty for him. Nuts. Uh, you didn't look so good, I guess. Did you ever stop to think that maybe it was you that didn't look so good? That face of yours would scare anything away. Yeah. I notice it ain't scared you away yet. Uh, hold it. Here comes another jalopy. Hey, waving that down. I am. Hey, stop it. And there's only one guy in it. Come on. 
Hey, want a lift, boys? Yeah, yeah, we sure do. Well, pile in. Thanks. Come on, Hank. I'm coming. Hey, where are you boys headed for? Oh, we're going for a long run. Yeah. And you're going to take us all the way. Huh? Keep your gun on him, Hank. I'll take the wheel. Hey, but look here, you can't do this. Shut up and move over, Mr. And Don't try nothing funny. Hey, you'll be arrested, you know, by the Quiet. first... Quiet. Hey. Oh, would you rather take a dose of lead poison? All right, yeah. all right. Better now move over here and let me get behind that wheel. Yes, of course. Of course. Come on, you clumsy lug. Okay. Now, we're taking a swell tour of the country, mister, and so long as you keep that mouth buttoned, you won't get hurt. I don't think. But open it and you'll be sorry. Watch him, Hank. We're off. Here, clutching at his throat with cold fingers, the kindly motorist huddles in the front seat of his own car while the youthful hitchhikers send it speeding south towards California. For seemingly endless hours, they ride this way. And then, after some 400 miles... The driver pulls the car off the road into a little side street and stops the motor. Hey, what are you going to do here? Get rid of you, Pop. This is the end of the line. Hey, yeah, but where are we? What am I going to do way out here? <laughs> Tell him, Hank. Sure, it's a pleasure. You're somewhere near Grass Pass, Oregon. After we get through tying you to that tree over there, it really don't matter much what you do. The main thing is we know you won't get to a telephone for some time. Very well done, Hank. Now, come on, mister, and make it fast. You say, you know, this is an awful thing to do to a person, boys. I might die out here, and nobody'd be the wiser for it. Now, think of having that on your soul for the rest of your life. Save it. Uh, Save it, Pop. You won't die. And if you do, so what? Uh, give me that rope, Hank. Here you go. Yeah, now, sit down here by this tree. Yeah, but you here. heard him. Sit down. Yeah, here. here you are, Hank. Take this end of the rope and fasten it there. Oh, uh, don't do that, boys. Tie it tight. Yeah. Please. Yeah, that's it. That's the idea. Now, uh, don't now, Hank, pass it around to me. There. Uh, uh, please don't. So, uh, there we are. All fixed. Just as cozy as can be. Now, mister, we're leaving. If you get too cold during the night, ring for the butler. I'm sure he'll be glad to get you anything you might want. Come on, Hank, let's blow. October 3rd, five nights later in an oil station on Florence Avenue in Los Angeles. Evening, gents. A little gas? Yeah. But check the oil first, will you? Sure thing. Hey, uh, where can I get a drink of water? Right inside the door there. Help yourself. Thanks. And, uh, say, you might clean the windshield while you're at it. Sure thing. You want a drink too, Hank? Yeah, I think I do. Uh, come on. All right, Hank. Do your stuff. Okay, he's cleaning the inside of the windshield now. It'll be easy. Get in that car. Oh, go on fast. Okay, I will. Oh, oh, get in there. All set, Bill. Hurry up. No, all right. Take it easy. Ah, fine business. Only ten bucks. Oh, well, it's better than nothing. Where are you taking me? For a nice little ride, mister. You mean you're going to kill me? I don't know just yet. We'll see. Now, shut up. And 40 minutes later, the terrified gas station attendant is hauled roughly out of the car near Lincoln and Manchester Avenues and dragged into a vacant lot. There, the two bandits tie him securely with bailing wire and make a laughing departure in their car. One hour later, at a small service station on North Vermont, the youthful pair strike again, kidnap the attendant, take him 35 miles out of the city and leave him tied to a tractor near Huntington Beach. And early the next morning at the Georgia Street Police Station, an unshaven, disheveled individual faces the desk sergeant with a strange story. I tell you, I was kidnapped right out of my own service station and dragged clear down to Huntington Beach. That's where they left me. How'd you get here? Oh, guy on the highway heard me yelling, gave me a lift into town. He's outside right now. You got a description of the men? License number of the car? Oh, I remember what the fellas looked like, all right. As far as the license numbers are concerned, I, I didn't have time to even see him. That's too bad. However, give me as good a description of the men as you can. We'll see what we can do. Well, they was both pretty young. Not over 20, I'd say. One of them had a nose that had been flattened by something. Kind of blonde hair. Heavy set. It was plenty tough. Seemed to be the leader. Long hair, heavy set. The other one, swarthy complexion, black hair, both under 20. Is that all we got to go on? That's right. 
If we don't bring these boys in before too long, you know what'll happen. Yeah, I think I do all right. We'll get a ribbing from the paper. Yeah, and from everybody else, too. Sometimes I wish I'd been born a crooner or something instead of a policeman. Well, too late now to do anything about it. Huh? Yeah, you're being a crooner, I mean. What we've got to do is find these boys. Right, and soon. I've got a statement here that the bandit's car was a black sedan, a Chevrolet. <laughs> With all the black Chevrolets around this town, it'll be a simple matter to find the one we want. Just pick it right out of the air or something. Sure, right out of the air. Well, come on, let's get that dope to the papers and get moving. I can't sit here any longer. So the first moves are made to apprehend the two youthful desperados. Word is flashed by teletype to all local substations to be on the lookout for a black sedan answering the meager description supplied by the victim. A description of the two boys is given to every cruising police car in Los Angeles. But the rest of that day and night goes by and no word is received. No reports of gas station robberies come into headquarters. The bandit car and its occupants seem to have disappeared into thin air. Then, 7 p.m., October 5th, on Main Street in Los Angeles. Come on, Hank. This car will do. Okay. Hey, what's going on here? I can't mount and move out. But I... Shut up, or would you rather get a dose of this? A gun? Yeah, and it's ready to go off any second. Well, don't shoot. I'll move over. Here. Yeah, that's better. I'll drive. Pile in the back, Hank. We're off. Now, listen careful, mister. We ain't made no definite plans about you yet. That sort of depends on how you act. But I'll tell you one thing. If you start any monkey business, you'll get a dose of lead slugs that won't feel too good. Now, how's about it? I, I won't try anything, honest. I won't say a thing. Now, well, that's smart. Maybe you'll get along all right at that. The swell bus you got here. Huh, Bill? Yeah, you're brand new. We can really go places in it. Yeah, huh? I wonder how fast it'll do. Oh, please, it, it's not even broken in yet. Don't try to go too fast, will I you? I thought you said you was going to keep that trap shut. What would you like? Your car burnt up a bit or your stomach filled with lead slugs? Uh, I'm sorry. I only thought that maybe you wouldn't ruin the car. I won't say any more. God, because if you do, I know how to stop you. Now, listen, mister. This is one time when it's up to you what happens. When we drive into this gas station here, keep real quiet. Or else. You understand? Yeah. Yes, I understand. Okay. See that you remember it. Get organized, Hank. We're going in here. Oh, set, Bill. Evening. Fill her up? Yeah. With yourself. Get in here and make it fast. I'll see. Fill her Now, oh, come on in back here. Oh, okay, only keep that gun on. Go outside. ahead, Bill. I'll keep our friends busy cleaning the windows till you get back. Okay. Not bad. Not bad at all. All right, Hank, I got all I want. You better stay back there with this guy until we get rid of him. Right, let's get going. Out towards the beach, the daring bandits drive their captives along the river, out through the crowded Beverly Hills section, through heavy traffic, then to Westwood. Finally, on a side road, they drag the gas station attendant out of the car and tie him to a ladder lying in a vacant lot. Then the three occupants of the car continue their wild flight. At breakneck speed, the pug-nosed individual hurls the car over the roads, out of Los Angeles to Bakersfield, where they stop long enough to rob another gas station and kidnap the owner and his wife. Then back on the highway again, and north to Fresno. In Fresno, they stop at a gas station, but give up the plan at the last minute, continued on to Modesto, where suddenly, in a lonely, uninhabited section, the driver pulls the car to an abrupt stop. All right, you two get out here. You're not going to leave us here with my wife only out of the hospital three days. I'm going to leave you here, and if you make another crack, I'll leave you laying flat. Uh, how about me? Uh, you want me to stay here, too? There eh, you go getting curious again. Now, you stay with us. I got other plans for you. Come on, Hank. Help me tie these two up. Okay, Bill, I'm right with you. You realize that this might kill my wife, don't you? I ain't interested in what this might or might not do. You're lucky to get off this easy if you only had sense enough to know it. The girl's all tied up, Bill. God, so's this guy. Now let's get moving. I hope they catch you two devils. Then I hope to get a chance to get my hands on you before they hang you. If I thought there was any chance of that, I'd fill you so full of slugs right now that you wouldn't be able to even talk. But don't worry, he ain't gonna catch us. Because we got it all figured out. He ain't got a chance in the world. All right, talk where you can, but they'll get you. Ah, hogwash. Come on, Hank, this guy's beginning to bore me. So, 
back to the highway and on with the seemingly never-ending tour. And a few hours later, they speed through Stockton, watch the lights of the city as they fade in the distance. Where to now, Bill? I think it's about time we get rid of this guy. He's uh, getting on my nerves. That suits me. I'd like to be able to relax for a while myself. And there ought to be a good place along here somewhere. Uh, what are you going to do with me? Uh, that all depends. I ain't make up my mind yet. If I was running things, I'd say get rid of them for good. Well, you ain't running things. I'm glad of that. Maybe you won't be before the day's over. You haven't got anything to gain by killing me? I don't know about that. You know a lot too much about us. You might spill it to the law. That's why I say get rid of them once and for all. All right, all right. Let's not beep about it. we got to find a place for it anyway. Here's a swell spot. Just a play. Here we are. Pile out. Okay. You know, I can't quite figure it out. It don't seem good to let you loose now. But I don't want no mess on my hands. You mean a mess on your hands? I thought you said we'd never get caught. They won't. Only if something did happen to slip up, we don't want no murder after. Say, what's got into you, Bill? You sound as though you were getting soft or something. Well, maybe, maybe I am. Only I don't feel right about this. You're, you're right about that murder business, kid. You're only making it tougher for yourself by killing me. Did anyone ask you for an opinion? No, only I thought maybe... Don't think. When you stop blabbing, I'm going to let you have it. Okay. Well, how about it, Bill? Ah, uh, not. We'll leave him here. Tie him to a tree or something. But that way he can squawk. You heard what I said. We're leaving him here. Uh, okay, Bill, you're the boss. That's right. Only sometimes you don't seem to remember it. Uh, I'm sorry, Bill. I didn't mean to shoot off my face. Okay, okay. Come on. Let's tie this guy down. I'm getting annoyed at standing around beefing about it. So Kenneth Milster, the unfortunate companion of the two bandits, finds himself tied to a tree miles from anywhere, but with his life still intact. Four hours after the bandits have left, he squirms, twists, frantically tries to undo the wire that holds him prisoner. And at last, he manages to free himself. Running to the road, he hails an early morning milk truck and gets a ride to Stockton, where he gives an account of the long vigil to Chief of Police, F.H. Fredericks. And in turn, with the license numbers of Milster's car in his possession, Chief Fredericks teletypes the Los Angeles authorities. Los Angeles Police, attention robbery detail. Have here in Stockton one Kenneth Milster, kidnapped with his car from your city October 5th by two armed bandits. Released this day near here by same. Took car with them. Description as follows. Pontiac Sedan, 1935. License number 9X6592. Two men. One, blonde, pug-nosed, heavy set. Believed to be about 20 years of age. Number two, light bill, dark complexion, dark hair, both armed. Request your office send statewide bulletins asking assistance. Fredericks, Chief of Police, Stockton, California. And in response, the Los Angeles authorities reply... Stockton Police, attention Chief Fredericks. Sending statewide bulletin to all points immediately. Please hold Milster for us until we come for him. These two men thought to be same as two men wanted here for gas station burglaries and kidnapping. Seeger, Los Angeles Police. Seeger, Los Angeles Police Department. Pontiac sedan, license number 9X6592, recovered here. Occupants missing. Holding Milster per your request. Frederick, Stockton Police. So the first good description of the missing car proved to be of little use to the police. But with the wheels of the law in full motion, detectives Maxwell and Anderson slowly tighten the net of evidence against the time when the two bandits will be apprehended. In the office of the robbery detail, the three Los Angeles victims are shown several mug pictures of youthful criminals, but fail to point out the wanted ones. Then, at 11 o'clock that night, October 7th, a message flashes across the teletype network to the Los Angeles police. Los Angeles Police Department, regarding your bulletin, regarding wanted men, Third man of this city kidnapped here, 9.30 p.m. by three armed men. Forced to drive them to outskirts of town. Thrown out of car. All wore dark suits. Gray hats. Description of car as follows. Auburn, 1932, Brome. Brown body. Tan cloth top. License number 9F4000. Headed south on Highway 99. Sheriff C.M. Hogan. Modesto Sheriff's Office. Highway 99. Hmm. Well, that means we can expect them back here in Los Angeles. 
If they don't change their mind. Right. And we'd better get word to all the boys to be on the lookout for that car. Our best chance is to get them before they have a chance to change cars again. Come on. Let's get this on the broadcast. Los Angeles police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Be on the lookout for 1932 Auburn Brome. Tan cloth top. License number 9 Frank 4000. Driven by three men. These men are wanted on robbery and kidnap charges. All three are armed, so be careful. That's all. Rose and Quirk. But almost before this broadcast is received by the various radio cars, a report comes in from a gas station operator on North Broadway. Yes, sir. They took all my money and made me get it in the car with them. What kind of a car? It was a 1934 Ford sedan. I got the license when they left me. Good. What was it? 2L7782. All right, Mr. Smoyer, and thanks a lot. Harry, cancel that last broadcast and send this one out, will you? Our boys have changed cars again. And early that same morning, Chief Detective Joe Taylor calls Captain Seeger into his office, gives new instructions. Accordingly, Captain Seeger assigns an officer to every strategic gas station in the Los Angeles city limits, then turns the office over to acting Captain E.J. Rivas. And in a radio car down in the Main Street, Beer Joint District, Lieutenant Anderson sits with one of his un- undercover men, waiting the return of his partner in Milster, when the radio suddenly comes to life. Calling car 15314. Attention, Maxwell and Anderson. Call your station at once. Car 15314. Call your station at once. Rolls and clear. Listen, Ed, I've got a call in, and I don't know where Maxwell and Milster are. You beat it into every joint in this block until you find them. Tell them to be on the corner of 3rd and Main in 15 minutes. I'll meet them there, okay? Okay. Thanks, and don't let me down. This might be important. A hasty call informs Anderson that there's an important bit of information waiting for him at the robbery squad office. So, after picking up his companions, he proceeds there at once. Here you are, Lieutenant. Teletype from Stockton that just came in for you. Thanks. Two original men, members of gang you're looking for, thought to be William S. Parker and Harold Lacey, both deserters from San Diego Naval Training Station. Parker's home, this city. Lacey from Fresno. Parker served term in Whittier Reform School, believed to have girlfriend living in Los Angeles. Her name, Mary Jennings. Address 2135 West Kingston Road. Fredericks, Stockton Police. So that's the attraction in Southern California, that girl. Think we ought to go out there now? No. First, I want to go out to Whittier and see if we can't get a picture of Parker. Come on, Mr. Milster. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to take another ride with us. I need your identification. That's perfectly all right with me. I, I don't mind riding around with you fellas, just as long as I don't have to go with those bandits anymore. And at the Whittier Reform School, Milster points to the picture of Parker and positively identifies him as the pug nose leader of the gang. With this in their possession, Maxwell and Anderson head back to Los Angeles. Stop at the office long enough to report their actions. And there, Pat Shepard, veteran newspaper reporter, insists on joining them. His newspaper man's intuition sensing a good story. So, a few minutes later, Anderson, Maxwell, Milster, and Shepard arrive at the address of Parker's girlfriend. Maxwell and Shepard quietly cross the yard to keep watch on the rear of the house while Anderson, after telling Milster to stay in the car and make himself as inconspicuous as possible, walks to the front door, rings the bell. Yes? I'm looking for a Mary Jennings. She live here? Yes, I'm her father. Yeah, what was it about? Well, I understand she has a friend named Parker. Bill Parker, is that right? Uh, yes, uh, that's correct. He was here tonight. He was? Mr. Jennings, may I come in for an instance? This is vitally important. I'm Lieutenant Anderson here on my credentials. An officer? Uh, yes, uh, come in. Uh, right in here. Thank you. Uh, we can uh, talk in here, I think. Uh, What's this all about? Mr. Jennings, I am sorry to have to be so blunt about it, but this friend of your daughter's, this Parker, is wanted up and down the line for robbery and kidnapping. What? That's the truth. He's a desperate man. Obviously, you can see the reason for my visit. Yes, yes, of course. Bill Parker, a robber, a kidnapper. Why, that seems impossible. Do you know where Parker is, Mr. Jennings? Well, I can try to show you. If you wait till I dress. Of course. And I needn't tell you, I suppose, that time is very important. Well, I'll hurry just as fast as I can. Won't be a minute, if you'll excuse me. I'll wait on the front porch. You join me there as soon as you're ready. No, I understand. I'll only be a moment. Bill. Bill. There's someone sitting in the car in the garage back there. Pat and I heard him talking. You sure? Positive. Okay, come on. Might be Parker. 
You and Pat cover me. I'll see who it is. Okay. Stand up. I'm going to call. Yeah, all right. We're all set. Come out of there. I'll blow your head off. Come on with your hands up. I'm not wasting any more time. Oh, all right. All right. I'm coming. Look, it's Parker, all right. Fits his picture perfectly. Yeah, and his girl's with him. Well, slap the cuffs on these two, Harry. Okay. Oh, you too, Mr. Jennings. I thought you were upstairs dressing. <laughs> well, you, you see, as, as a matter of fact... All uh, right, uh, I understand. Harry, slap some bracelets on this fellow, too. I'm not taking any chances now. Thing. Come on, come on. Stick out your hand. Parker, where's your pals? That's for you to find out. How about you, young lady? You I'm... know where they are? I don't even know who you're talking about. Oh, you don't? You never heard of Harold Lacey? No. I know a friend of Bill's, but I don't see what this is all about anyway. Surprise you if I told you that Bill here is the leader of a three-man gang that's wanted for kidnapping, robbery, and plenty of things, eh? I don't believe it. Okay, it's the truth, though. All right, Harry, round them up. We'll take them all in. What are you taking Mary for? She don't know nothing. I'm not so sure of that, Parker. I think she knows plenty. Anyway, she goes to jail. But she don't know a thing, I tell you. All right, Bill, there's plenty of time to do your shouting. Right now, you and Mary and I are going for a little ride to the station. That is, if you don't want to tell me where Lacey is. Well, if I tell you where he is, will you will you let Mary go? I think I can say yes to that. Mm. All right. All right, let her go. I'll, I'll show you. I thought you would. Come on, Harry, we're going to pick up the rest of the gang. <laughs> A few minutes later, at a small rooming house on East Fifth Street, Maxwell, Anderson, and Shepard stand before a door, from under which streams a crack of light. The door's locked. We bust in. If it's open, walk in. All set. Okay. Yeah. yeah and here it. goes. Hey, what the devil? Put him up, Lacey. Hi. Nab that fellow on the bed, Harry. Hey, what is this? I won't put up nothing for no one. All right, then I'll put him up. Hey, here. What are you doing? Let's Let's go, you. your hands where they can't get loose. Right to the chair. Hey, hey this guy hey, dog like a light, Bill. What are you... Well, put the cuffs on him, Harry. We got him, and we're going to keep... Him. Hey, how'd your boys know we was here? Well, I'll tell you, son. It's just another case of a woman being the cause of everything. Yes, sir. We got the woman, and now we've got you. Think it over. Lacey and Parker were both sentenced to San Quentin Penitentiary to serve a term up from six years to life. The third boy, James Lawson, was sentenced by Superior Court Judge D.M. Young of Stockton to San Quentin for the same term. Thus, once again, has been demonstrated the folly of embryonic criminals in allowing themselves to be deceived by the false glamour given by publicity to the exploits of John Dillinger and his ilk. Thank you, Chief Davis. Every time you hear a siren, either on the air or on the street, let it remind you that Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline is the gasoline of police car performance. And that you can have the same brilliant results from your own car that police cars get just by patronizing your independent Rio Grande dealer. Besides featuring exactly the same Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline that police cars use, your independent Rio Grande dealer also offers you the finest motor oils that money can buy. Sinclair Pennsylvania and Sinclair Opaline. They are so thoroughly de-waxed, so thoroughly de-jellied, so free from impurities that they flow freely on coldest mornings. Yet no amount of engine heat can break them down. Sinclairize your motor. Your car will start quicker, run smoother, and last longer. And get the latest copy of Calling All Cars News from your Rio Grande dealer. Exclusive movie news, detective stories, thrilling features, all about the junior G-man and detective outfits for youngsters, and how you can get them absolutely free just by purchasing a few gallons of Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Get your copy tomorrow. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. Copyrighted program created by the...